Okay, we're back. So uh, in the last video, we saw um, in the mid 1700s, um, Needham set out to show that there was a vital force. And what he did, again, was he took some broth that, whoops, wow, that's strange, that usually has some cells in it. And if you leave it out, it will rot. He boiled it to kill those cells, sealed it so that no new cells could get in, and then it rotted. So somehow cells grew despite the fact that he boiled them. So what's going on with this? Well, um, 27 years later, Spallanzani uh, repeated the experiment, um, but he added a variable, so he left some tubes open. And he also increased uh, the boiling time. Um, so what did he find? Well, his stoppered tubes did not rot. So um, again, what that means is that what we would expect to happen happened where, let's see, I guess I didn't draw that, but what we would expect to happen is if if you start out with some cells in some broth um, and you whoops <sighs> sorry everyone if you um, yes start out with some broth and then boil it what happens is these cells die and what we would expect is if you stoppered it and no new cells could get in we would expect to see at the end of some time clear broth with no new cells no rotting that's what we would expect um, that's not what Needham found, right? His tube still rotted, so he could say a vital animating force got in there and replaced the dead cells. Spallanzani did the same experiment, but he increased the boiling time, and he found that um, what we expect to happen happened, and no vital animating force got in there. Nothing like that happened, and no new cells were created. So what's going on here is um, it takes some time to kill bacteria as we will see uh, when we get to the lecture of the control of microorganisms um, you can't instantly kill a bunch of bacteria through heating or bleach or any other method even incineration if you threw them into the surface of the sun um, they would take a finite amount of time to die and so in th this is a case where boiling is a slow method of killing them and Needham didn't boil them long enough and some of the cells in Needham's experiments survived and so they then replicated or uh, reproduced like this kind of thing um, and his tubes rotted no vital force necessary um, right and so Spallanzani showed that um, if, um, if he boiled the tubes lo longer, they would stay sterile, but he also added a variable, right? He added a variable where he had tubes that he boiled that had cells in them that presumably got killed during the boiling. Um, that's why I X these out. Presumably that got killed during the boiling, but he left these tubes open. And after a certain amount of time, they were full of microorganisms. They rotted. They were full of microorganisms. Um, so what's the difference between an open tube and a stoppered tube? In Spallanzani's experiment, that's the variable that mattered, right? That's the difference between bacteria growing in the tube and no bacteria in the tube. So, um, right, so 
spawns on me, got those results. Does that contradict spontaneous generation of animalcules? Well, maybe. Um, I mean, I have been showing you what a modern microbiologist knows happened in those experiments, but they didn't know what was happening. They were trying to figure it out. Um, so Spallanzani had our interpretation. He said that he killed the cells, and since it was sealed, no new cells came in, so it didn't rot. If he left it open, new cells came in to replace the ones that died. That was what Spallanzani said happened in his experiments. Needham thought Spallanzani had killed the vital force. He had boiled the tube until even the vital force was dead. So um, how can you argue against that? Yeah, how, how, could you, um, how could you respond to someone saying the vital force is necessary for creating cells? That's a very difficult thing in biology and science and in anything we do when we try to explain the world around us. If our explanation involves magic or something that cannot be tested directly, um, then we're, we're done. We can't understand anything better. Um, that's the fundamental thing science has done that has pushed science away from religion since the beginning. It is, if we try to understand the world by saying that a deity does X, Y, and Z, no one can test that. We can't do an experiment to prove or disprove that. But if we can understand the physics and chemistry, little by little, we can get to the point where we can test explanations. Another example of separation is like, there are things about the world we don't understand. There are things about government we don't understand. There are things we don't like. And so one explanation for these can be a conspiracy. We can say, well, I don't like this and I don't understand this and it doesn't do what we expect it to do. So it must be a conspiracy. There must be secret forces. Um, and that can never be tested because you can't prove or disprove that there are secret forces because they're secret. But at the same time, there are people who study government and they do Freedom of Information Act requests to get um, minutes of boards. They find out what groups of people talked about. People in government have to write down the things they talk about. So you can get those and study the way government actually works. So there you can have two completely different ways of thinking about the same thing. And so that's led to kind of in our modern world, we have different belief systems. We use science to try to understand the things that we can directly understand through experimentation. And we have philosophies and religions that help us understand the sorts of things science could never tell us. And the key thing I want you to be able to do is tell the difference between them. And so when we look at, when we look at things like spontaneous generation, we are seeing people who don't yet have the understanding they need, they don't yet have the background information they need to come up with a good explanation. So saying something like vital force makes sense because they don't know anything else they can test. Um, so don't laugh at these people. Um, they are doing the best they can, and these would have been some of the smartest people. That was kind of where it was left for a hundred years, um, essentially. As microscopes improved, people were able to see bacteria and um, other microorganisms, and they weren't so, so mysterious, but we didn't know where they came from. We didn't know whether there was a, what I now call a magical vital force or a magical corrupting gas. Um, the best thinkers thought that's what was going on. They didn't know how cells worked, so they could just as easily think of something like a vital force. So the person who finally um, kind of crushed spontaneous generation of microorganisms was Louis Pasteur. And he did a series of experiments using flasks 
and um, sterile broth. So this is very similar to what I just showed you with Spallanzani, the same idea where he'd boil broth until it was sterile and then he'd seal a flask or not seal it and then let it incubate. So what do you think would happen in this one? And what do you think would happen in this one? Go ahead and pause this video, predict what you're gonna see and then start it again. Three, two, one, pause. Well, as Spallanzani saw, um, Pasteur would see that if he left this open to the air, um, this would rot, or microorganisms would, would grow and appear. And if he didn't, uh, they wouldn't. So, um, and again, Needham might have said, well, you're killing the vital force uh, by boiling it so much. Um, and that's why um, the well, I don't know. So people looking at Pasteur's experiments could, um, could say that uh, the, the heat killed the corrupting gas, and so new corrupting gas would have had to get in to create new cells or something like that. So Pasteur had to design a system that is similar to what we've seen, where there'd be growth or no growth, where he could sterilize the meat, the, the broth first to get rid of any, or any organisms that were present at the beginning, kill them, and prevent new organisms from getting in while still allowing gases to get in and still allowing magical electrical things flying through the air getting in. Um, and so what he designed was his famous swan-necked flask that looks like this. It has a very long neck. And he could start by boiling it. And one thing he could do would be break off the top. So now it's open and microorganisms would appear. But if he didn't do that, he wouldn't get any growth even though this is technically open to the air. So we now know oxygen can very slowly diffuse in and carbon dioxide can diffuse out, other gases, nitrogen can go both ways, because um, this is just a long open tube. But what we now know is dust and solid objects like bacteria would collect here and they would not be able to go back up like this. Dust is, after all, uh, the biggest source of contamination in microbiology labs. Dust is lots of different things. It's lots of different small, solid objects, but what they all have in common is they all have bacteria on them, or they all have fungal spores on them. So dust is what can settle out of the air and bring microorganisms with it. We would now predict that in a, in this kind of a flask would stay sterile as long as this whatever was trapped here never touched um, the liquid. So if there was miasma or corrupting gas, it could have gotten in, but it didn't. Um, this is evidence that there was no miasma because this will stay sterile forever as long as this doesn't touch the, the broth. Um, same thing with vital forces that no one could explain. Um, they, they can't pretend that a magical electrical force um, would be excluded by this tube. And the final um, nail in the coffin of this is Pasteur then rotated the flask. He tilted it so that some of the fluid would get to there and then he'd allow that to go back in and it would rot. So he could then basically expose this liquid to this dust. So this is the the experiment that disproves spontaneous generation of bacteria to most scientists. And so um, people who are aware of this in the 1850s um, knew that they needed to think of a different way that um, a different way to explain uh, creation of, of 
microorganisms. Um, so yeah, Louis Pasteur, we could say he disproved spontaneous generation of microorganisms. We now can say that the cell theory is a better way to um, explain microorganisms than um, than anything with vital forces or miasma, or corrupting gases, whatever. We we have the cell theory, um, and Pasteur would have been aware of it, and he didn't advance the cell theory but he did disprove spontaneous generation which would have been competing with the cell theory pasteur also separately tried to popularize the germ theory of disease again this is the theory that microorganisms are responsible for infectious disease he tried to show this he tried to uh, demonstrate um, very clearly that microorganisms cause infections um, but he wasn't able to um, ever in his life do that and we'll come back to that because um, we're gonna look at two more historical um, we're gonna look at basically two two more people and the historical things they did um, maybe three I guess we're gonna look at three so that will be our next video i think that's the thing to do um, we will be back with the next video to finish the history of microbiology